three common phases of matter are solids, liquids, gases, and a fourth that in our surroundings is less common, plasma. In this lesson, we'll discuss solids. Many solids are composed of crystals, three-dimensional orderly arrays of atoms. Such solids include metals, salts, and most minerals. Then there are solids that lack crystalline structure called amorphous. Examples are rubber, glass, and plastic. One way to describe a solid is by its density. Density is the ratio of mass to volume. Density is a property of a material. It's how much matter can be squeezed into a given space regardless of the amount of material. A gold nugget or a bar of gold has the same ratio of mass to volume, 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter. Gold is 19.3 times more dense than water. Water at 4 degrees Celsius has a density of exactly 1 gram per cubic centimeter. Why 4 degrees Celsius? Because the volume of all materials, solids, liquids, or gases, change with temperature. Water is densest at 4 degrees Celsius, and that is the chosen standard. We all know that a common spring can be easily stretched or compressed. To a lesser degree, a steel bar can be stretched or compressed. Here's a beam, which can be of wood, metal, or most any material. The sag in the beam is due to the heavy load on its end. Can you see that the top part of the beam is stretched, that it's under tension? Atoms there tend to be pulled apart. How about the bottom part? Can you see that it's compressed, that it's under compression? Atoms there tend to be squeezed together. And the bottom part is slightly shorter than the top part. Now here's the interesting thing. In the middle portion of the beam, between top and bottom, there's a region that is neither stretched nor compressed, which I show with this dashed line. In this mid-region is the neutral layer. Consider a beam supported at its ends with a heavy load in the middle. Can you see that in this case the top part is under compression and the bottom part is under tension? and that it must also have a neutral layer, a region between being compressed and stretched? Extending the idea of the neutral layer, consider the common I-beam, widely used in construction. The I-shape is especially important when beams are horizontal and support heavy loads. Here we look at a cross-section view of the beam. Most of the I-beam's material is concentrated in the top and bottom regions, called flanges. When the I-beam is used horizontally in construction, the stress is predominantly in the top and bottom flanges. One flange is stretched and the other is compressed. Between the flanges is a relatively stress-free region called the web, which acts mainly to hold the top and bottom flanges well apart. Because of the web, considerably less material is needed to make the beam, which is nearly as strong as a solid rectangular bar of the same overall dimensions, with considerably less weight. A large rectangular steel beam on a certain span might fail under its own weight, whereas an I-beam of the same depth could support itself in a much heavier load. Is this yum? Before the time of steel and I-beams, Slabs of rocks were used as building materials. But rock doesn't hold up well under tension. Fracturing occurs. A construction no-no. So more vertical supports were needed. Hence the many vertical rock columns needed to support the horizontal slabs of rock on early buildings. As in ancient Greece. And in the Jefferson Memorial in America. Rock can't cope with tension, but it does fine with compression, hence the advent of arches in construction. The semicircular arch of this structure distributes compression throughout its entire form. The greater the weight of load it supports, the greater the compression between its blocks. Depending on the shape of the blocks, compressive forces add to its strength. These red vectors indicate compressive forces. Even the uppermost block, called the keystone, 
is held firmly in place by compressive forces. I circle the keystone here. Centuries later, the catenary arch was discovered. A catenary is a specific curve taken up by a sagging chain or rope when suspended at both ends. Can you see that the tension in each link aligns with the direction of the chain along its entire length? I show the tension vectors for five links, each pulled in a direction exactly along the chain at every point. Get the idea? We can extend this idea upside down to an arch. Here's a photo of my grandson Manuel holding a chain with the gateway arch of St. Louis in the background. Tensions between links along the entire chain are aligned. Gateway arch takes the shape of a catenary. The compressive forces in its stainless steel structure are aligned with the shape of the curve at every point. As with the chain, I indicate the compression vectors for five places. Catenary arches have been around for a long time, at least since the 17th century. Catenaries can be found in nature, too. Maybe you know how difficult it is to crush an egg between your hands when the long axis of the egg is aligned with your force. Here's an activity that will perk interest in your friends. Drape a jewelry chain very near an egg. Your friends will see that the egg is a catenary. A deeper catenary on the narrower end of the egg, and a shallower catenary on the more rounded end of the egg. Nature knows her physics. Let me leave you with a question. Like the beams previously discussed, stresses of tension and compression abound in the branches of trees. Focus on the heavy horizontal branch. Suppose that a horizontal hole is drilled through the branch. In which of these three locations, near the top, near the bottom, or in the middle, will the drilled hole weaken the branch the least? Defend your answer. Until next time, good energy.